This podcast is part of the Shareable Podcast Network. Learn more at shareable.fm. Great. Thank you, Tim. I am Sarah O'Hannison, and I am today's host of the Heroic Council. I am here with two wonderful guests, my co-host who you're used to seeing, Tim Uli, but also joining us today is Tony, who is a lawyer, Tony Lopez, and he's going to be talking all about everything legal. So I call this episode Legally Speaking because we have uh, so much to cover today. Um, but make sure you tune in every Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time where we live stream on uh, LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook. And then also you can catch us on your favorite podcast apps after the fact. So those drop a few days after. So, um, and remember, if you love the show, you can leave us an iTunes rating and review. So thank you so much. Let's dive in. Tony, please tell everybody just a little bit about yourself. And, um, you know, we're going to get into why the legal stuff matters, but let's start by who are you and what do you do? Sure. Thank you both for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to meet everybody out there who's listening to this. Uh, hopefully this won't be too boring. And after lunch, we won't put anyone to sleep, of course, hopefully. Um, but I am an attorney by trade, and, and that's sort of what I do by day. But I'm also an adjunct professor at Temple. I run my own podcast called Self-Made Strategies. That's the logos you see behind me. Sarah was kind enough to be a guest of ours on Self-Made Strategies as well. And uh, I'm also a co-founder of an organization called College Cast that is bringing podcasting to college students to help them empower their own voices. Just a few things. Just a couple of things. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's great. Well, I want to hear more about all of those things. But awesome. today we're here really specifically to talk about the legal aspects of our business. Um, I know Tim and I personally have been through this. And it's, I think sometimes it can be some of the boring stuff or not even so much that it's boring, but it's unknown. Like we're just not sure what to do. And there is so much information out there. So it's wonderful to have you as a trusted resource for people. So let's start by just the business structure, right? Like we're going to go set up our business. We have this idea. We've decided to take the plunge as entrepreneurs. Where do we even start? legally and I, I think it's the business structure but maybe you can tell us more about that and and how how do we even get started <laughs> well first and foremost thank you for for that segue first and foremost the thing you want to do is talk to an attorney before you even bother doing anything and if you're talking to the right attorney hopefully it's not too boring and the conversation should be mainly about you and your business anyways um, so what you want to do is you want to talk to an attorney about, of course, the structure, the entity choice that you want to choose, um, what you want to do from a tax perspective, what your long-term goals are, the types of clients that you'll be working with, uh, and maybe some of the issues that you might be facing in the first three, six, nine, 12 months of operations of your business. This is not, in my opinion, the time for DIY, right? Um, this could cost you a lot more money in the long run if you do things wrong early on. So you want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success by working with the right attorney or working with the right legal team. Um, you know, that could be me, that could be another attorney. Just make sure that they're speaking your language, that they're asking you questions about your business, not really talking so much about themselves and how great they are as attorneys, but more so about what you have going on and the types of problems that you might be facing in sort of the early stages of your organization. That's a really good point. Cause I was sort of thinking, yeah, like technically what do we need to do? But you're right. Maybe you don't even have an attorney in the first place. Um, what are some qualities that we should be looking for in a good attorney? And like, I'm assuming we should feel comfortable with them. They're going to be a big part of our uh, start of our business. Yeah, first and foremost, if they're being vague about their billing policies or, or, you know, saying that, oh, it depends on how much it's going to cost, that's probably a red flag to begin with, right? They want to be really transparent, at least I am. And you want to have a clear understanding and they should be speaking your language. If they're using a lot of terms that seem to be confusing you and they're not explaining things to you in a way that you feel comfortable, 
that's probably not going to be a good recipe for a good long-term relationship, which is what you should be looking for. Yeah, that's a really good point. Tim. Oh, we lost you. Obviously, a lot of uh, businesses are uh, are very different. Um, so is there any things that are like kind of general to like most or all businesses or like like or, or is there a specific approach that attorney would take depending on the industry that they're working with? Yeah, each each industry is specific in and of itself. You're right. And each business is going to have its own problems to begin with based on the experience level of the the team or individual that's going to be sort of the founding members of that organization. I'd say, look, speak to your attorneys, of course, but generally speaking, an LLC is probably what you're going to be, a limited liability company is probably going to be what you're going to be forming, especially if you're unsure about what you're doing, you probably don't need a more complex business structure. So I'd say that generally speaking, an LLC is going to be a good fit for the majority of the businesses that are starting up. And they can be very sophisticated and still be an LLC. But that's also going to enable you to have a lot of flexibility down the road in terms of how you want to set things up, how you want to allocate profits and losses among the founding members or the members of the organization as you grow. And it's just going to give you the most flexibility, most likely. That's that's really helpful to know because that was a question I also had was if I start this and I, I create it in a certain way, I mean, am I stuck forever? Like how how easy are some of these things to change once you have them set up? Because it's a little scary when you're just getting started, like sign here and it feels so <laughs> formal and final. Yeah, long term, I mean, the longer you go, the harder it is to unwind, right? Because you mm -hmm. just have more complexity from uh, accounting perspective and maybe, you know, the, the funds and the assets and the liabilities of the organization, all of those things make it a little bit tougher to wind up or to transition into something else. I'd say, again, from a simplicity standpoint and from a uh, flexibility standpoint, the LLC is generally speaking one of the better options for businesses. Of course, you can form as an S Corp, which is a subchapter S corporation or a subchapter C corporation. Now, generally speaking, a very low percentage of startups are going to want to go subchapter C from the gate. So what you want, generally speaking, to get the most tax advantage and the most tech tax benefit for your organization is to form as a pass-through entity. This is going to get a little confusing, and that's where you want to kind of have that conversation with your own attorney about what's the best structure. But both of those pass-through entities would be an S-corporation or a LLC. Now, the S-corporation is a little bit harder in the sense that it's tougher to administer from an administrative perspective. You're supposed to have an annual meeting every year. You should have a board of directors. You need bylaws. You need a shareholders agreement. There's a lot more in terms of moving parts going on. With an LLC, you really just need how many members do we have starting this organization? And even if it's a single member, I can have a single member LLC, which is what's called the disregarded entity, generally speaking. And all you really need is an operating agreement. You don't need a board. You don't need to have all of this complexity surrounding the organization. It's very, very flexible. And that's why typically, not in every case, but typically we might suggest that people consider that first. So, uh, so okay, so we have our LLC set up. Um, and we're, uh, what, are, what are generally like the next steps? What are some important things that we need to be considering so we can protect ourselves in our, like, let's say hypothetically we work with clients. So like we're protecting ourselves in the case something goes wrong with one of our clients. Like what, what, what should we be thinking about next? Well, this is where having a really savvy and a good savvy attorney that, that speaks your language is important right? Because let's say, Tim, you're going to start a business, right? And let's say it's going to be a widget factory, right? You're going to develop widgets, you're going to sell it online, you've got this great idea for a Shopify site. Well, this is where if I were your attorney, I'd be stepping in and saying, okay, well, what type of clients are you dealing with? Do we have any cybersecurity issues? Do we need any particular agreements like a master services agreement, or some form of agreement to protect you and your organization from potential liability risks? And really what we're going to sit, do, sit, sit down and do is 
have this discussion where we sort of map out a timeline of the first 12 months of your business, right? When do we need those agreements to kick in? Do we have intellectual property issues that are concerning? Are you going to be competing at a national level or is this really just more of a local thing? So we'd have all of those discussions. We take a big, big picture look, a 30,000 foot view look at your business and your organization, and we try to set you up in the best way possible. There really isn't a one size fits all model for literally everything, but you start with the LLC, you set up an operating agreement, now the organization's running. You're gonna have to go out and of course get any local licenses that you might need, like a business activity license or something along those lines, a business privilege license, depending on your county or city that you're organizing in. Um, you're going to need a bank account for that. You'd need a federal EIN, okay, which is an employer identification number. It's kind of like your business's social security number with respect to the IRS. So you need all of those things, operating agreement, EIN, and the formation, the articles of organization, if it's an LLC, for example, so that you can go and set up your bank account. Now you've got your bank account. You want to keep all of the money going in and out of your business completely separate from your personal finances. So you wanna put all of that in your organization's bank account. And you wanna treat it very delicately as its own bank account. The worst thing you can do is start, for example, paying personal bills or anything like that out of your organization's bank account. So taking a step back, those are the necessary items. But then you with your attorney should be having that discussion about what do I need big picture to protect myself? And not only that, agreements are often looked at by most people, I think, somewhat incorrectly in the sense that they look at them as these legally binding documents, which they are, but they're really a great tool to set terms and to, to be really transparent with the different stakeholders that you're working with, right? Whether that's a vendor, whether that's a client, whether that's some other organization that you're maybe doing some form of collaboration with, you should be looking at them as a tool to build transparency, to open up lines of communication, to make things really, really clear. And again, if your attorney is really just handing you several pages of document and saying, hey, here, use this, this is good, and it's got a bunch of legalese in it, and you don't understand it, and your attorney's not explaining it well to you so that you can understand it and use it as a useful tool in your business, that's probably a another red flag that you wanna look out for. Mm -hmm. So there's so much here, right? And so I think it can be really intimidating for people who don't have a legal background, who are really just excited to dive in and start their business. That's scary enough. Now we have to do all of these things. So I think I know how you're going to answer this, but I'd love your perspective on, I have dumb questions. <laughs> is it okay to ask my attorney? And how comfortable should I be? Should I really have a handle on all this stuff or just sort of trust that my attorney has my back. You know, what's your advice on that? Because I think it's, you know, a lot of times you're paying by the by the minute to the attorney, so you don't want to waste their time with all the questions. But I feel like it's important to really understand these documents and understand what you're signing. So what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, so generally speaking, uh, I'm a little critical of the legal industry in general, despite being an attorney, because I do think that attorneys who tend to bill, bill hourly mainly, right, if that's their main practice, and most attorneys do bill hourly, that's not aligned with the client's goals, right? So Sarah, in your case, it wouldn't be aligned with your goals if you're, you're suffering from this apprehension about calling your attorney just to ask a simple question. Right. And that's generally speaking, at least what I try to promote is that we don't want that. I want to be your first call, not the call that you're worried about in the sense that, oh, how many tenths of an hour is he going to charge me for this call to answer a question that is necessary for us to do the work together. Right. For you to grow your organization. So first and foremost, that's a bad sign. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning in the sense that if your attorney is being really vague about their billing practices, or if the number sounds really, really, really low, those are all bad signs. Mm. Okay. Because usually that's some form of, you know, kind of a bait and switch that we don't like. Um, mm. Generally speaking, a lot of these things, if an attorney is well established, I know exactly how much time it's going to take me to draft a master services agreement. And every agreement that I do, for example, I sit down currently on Zoom, right? We haven't met live and in person for a while, but 
Uh, but I'll sit down with the client and I will go through that agreement on a screen share clause by clause and say, this is what this clause means. Mm -hmm. This is how it applies to your business day to day. This is how it'll apply to your relationships with your subcontractors, with your employees, with your vendors, with your clients, whoever it is. And this is how you use it as a tool in your business. And the client has the opportunity to ask whatever questions they want. And by the way, it doesn't stop there, of course, right? So if there's questions later or something that we happen to not cover or that slipped their mind that came up later, later, I want that openness. I want that, shoot me a quick email, send me a quick text message. Let me know if there's something that you don't understand because otherwise this is useless, right? So that's part of it. I agree with you. And I think that's what your question was getting at. You should not be feeling that apprehension with the attorney that you're, you're considering using or that you're in a relationship with. It really should be this relationship of, I'm here to help you to build your business. And hopefully that's a long lasting relationship. Yeah, and I'm assuming that you, you as, as an attorney, want the client to feel like they know these documents, they understand these documents. I mean, I'm assuming a vendor could ask me, what does this document mean? I should be able to answer right. that question. So I'm assuming you agree that that's really important that you yourself as the as the business owner do understand what these documents entail. Yeah, honestly, I, I read somewhere once that legalese, you know, these highfalutin legal terms or whereas is and where to fors and thereafters and herein's and all of that stuff that you see in agreements a lot of times are put in there by attorneys because they don't fully understand exactly oh. how this is functioning, right? So oh, they no. think if we use this mystical language, then people will have to keep coming back to us because I, I, I will tell you truthfully, there are agreements that I have read that I have said, what is going on in here? I don't understand mm. it. How could the client or the parties to the, to the relationship possibly understand? And a lot of times what you really need is just clear, concise, transparent language, mm -hmm. right? What happens if there's a pandemic and you can no longer fulfill my supply vendor, right? Mm -hmm. We need to have outs. We need to have clear, concise language that says we can't cover literally every scenario. Fine. But we can say, here are the terms of the deal right? You're going to supply me with X materials. I'm going to turn them into a widget that I'm going to sell to somebody else. If the pandemic hits, what happens, right? Now, now we should be, as a best practice, we should be seeing clauses in every agreement that says, if there's a quarantine or a governmental shutdown, a government mandated shutdown, what happens, right? Yeah. And, and we're still not really seeing that because we see a lot of this sort of reusing clauses that have worked in other places as well and we're just putting them into into agreements as as lawyers right that's what you see a lot of attorneys doing and that's no good that's no good for anybody but especially not for the client and so a lot of times i will say this i i saw a um i represented a client recently in a uh, agreement that they needed reviewed they were going to be working with a really large um very famous tech company I won't name the tech company, obviously, but um, I have to say the agreement was very well drafted. And you know what? It was really clear. And there wasn't very, very, a lot of this legalese language that was confusing because they have attorneys who know what they're doing and who know clearly this is the relationship. This is mm -hmm. how much we're paying you. Here's our expectation. It's a two-year agreement. At the end of two years, we'll figure it out. But here's exactly what we're looking for. It was very, very clear. So I think that's what you want to see more and more the more we go forward is, is my attorney A, speaking my language? Because if they're not, they don't understand your business, okay? That is clear as can be. If they're not saying these are the type of clients that you're working with, or at least asking you the questions, right? If you walk into an attorney's office and you say, I'm a fashion designer, my wife's a fashion designer, so I know way more about wedding gowns than any lawyer should. But um, so let's say you walk into an office, to your attorney's office, and you say, hi, I'm a fashion designer, you know, I'm starting a business. What agreements should I have? And if they're not asking you about the types of clients that you're seeing, the types of gowns that you're designing or clothing or alterations or whatever it is, then there's a problem there, right? If they think they know everything, that's a bad sign. Mm. 
Really uh, good so, advice. Um, regarding like uh, uh, I agreements and more specifically IPs, I work in content development. I do a lot of visual content and I do web web website pieces like that. Something I've been always curious about is um, if you create content for a client, you know what I mean? Like what are some good things, what are some things that you should be considering as, uh, for, for structuring your agreements? Cause like, you know, cause I've seen, I've seen it some ways where the clients end up owning all the content at the end. And then sometimes where the, where the client's leasing the content um, from, from the, uh, from the creator, like what, what are some things that you should be thinking about and why should you be thinking about those things? Great question. And that depends a lot on the type of content that you're developing. Um, if you're developing video content or if you're developing original works of art where you're putting a lot of creativity into this and, um, and you want to own the content later, that's something you need to have discussed in advance. And to your point, you really need to think these things through and that's why you need an attorney that's going to say, well, who's going to own the content? And under what terms and under what situations is the client going to own the content and allow you sort of a free license to use it on your portfolio or on your reel or on your website? That's fine as long as you have those terms hashed out. Is it a work made for hire, which is a term that you'll, you'll see frequently used in these sort of creative agreements? Um, is there sometimes there's shared ownership of the creative content, right? Even between the client and the producer of that, of that uh, work. Um, the tech company in question that I was talking about, again, won't, won't name the tech company, but it was a similar agreement. They were hiring my client to do creative work for them to create, to generate some content. In this case, with much larger organizations, you'll see that work made for hire is gonna be the standard and you're not gonna have a lot of room to negotiate. But if you're a freelancer and you're working sort of one-on-one -on -one or you're working for a creative agency, it's going to depend heavily on the type of work that you're doing and whether or not the client is going to be more open to allowing you to keep ownership of the content. Mm -hmm. And then as far as trademarks go, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, maybe you can even explain to, to our listeners, you know, what's the difference between intellectual property, trademarks, you know, uh, copyright? What, what do we need to be concerned about in that space? And I'm assuming it does also depend on what type of content we are creating. It does. And great question. So intellectual property, first and foremost, is just sort of an overarching kind of umbrella term for everything that is intellectual property, right? Property that comes from my thoughts, my ideas, my creative work, right? So that would include copyrights, that would include trademarks, that would include um, patented uh, inventions, that would include trade secrets, sort of, kind of under, under that umbrella as well, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is also. Um, so generally speaking, uh, copyright applies to what we'll call creative works of authorship. So that could be written works, that could be drawings, that could be uh, musical works, sound recordings, and on and on and on and on, including motion pictures, et cetera, right? It, it actually enc encapsulates a lot of different types of creative work in that. Now, copyright is sort of an interesting subsection of intellectual property law. And by the way, we're not going to cover this even, <laughs> even, even in the smallest amount. Uh, I teach a whole intellectual property course at Temple and, um, and, uh, and then separately teach an entertainment law course at Temple. So mm -hmm. um, this stuff gets broad and broad and broad, right? But copyrights, generally speaking, are an interesting area of IP law in the sense that you can register for copyright protection by going to copyright.gov or um, if you're doing a written creative work, like uh, essentially anything written, including screenplays, including poetry, prose, et cetera. Um, generally speaking, you can go to copyright.gov or you could go to the Writers Guild of America, East or West, to register some of those creative works. The Writers Guild only accepts certain works like treatments, um, screenplays, that kind of stuff. Um, but again, copyright covers everything from even choreography, for example, in, in terms of being a creative work, sound recordings, uh, musical uh, compositions, 
uh, motion pictures, uh, digital pictures, or um, actual photographic pictures, right? Um, so it encapsulates all of that. Now, copyright is interesting in the sense that there's a common law aspect, and then there's the uh, registration aspect to it. It's one of the rare forms of intellectual property in that if I create something, right, and I put it on my website, for example, I don't necessarily have to go and register that with the copyright office to be afforded copyright protection. Mm. But one of the things is for me to, for example, win a copyright infringement claim against someone who's copied my work, I would have to prove that they've actually copied it. Okay. Now a trademark exists more for brands, slogans, uh, logos, that kind of thing. And trademarks or service marks, by the way, but we'll just say trademarks to stay um, as simple as possible, exist in what's called paired relationships. So for example, you have the Apple logo applied to consumer electronics or s smartphones or Apple TV, for example, those kinds of things. However, you wouldn't be able to trademark Apple for a piece of fruit, okay? So they exist on this um, distinctiveness scale of how distinctive is the mark. And what you're looking for is something that's fanciful or arbitrary to be the most protectable in terms of trademarks. If it's generic or merely descriptive like Apple for a piece of fruit, it's not going to be protectable, generally speaking generic now merely descriptive you might get some protection but that's again getting a little complex so what what we usually advise clients is sarah you wouldn't want to start a company called sarah's cleaners because you're never going to be able to trademark that okay mm -hmm. yeah. but if but if you said something like now uh i i hesitate to use an existing brand so we'll have to come up with something fanciful but if you came up with a completely made up word that's not ever been used before for cleaners, then that would be arbitrary or fanciful. We could argue about, about what level of distinctiveness it has, but you would be potentially able to get protection for that. Um, and translations, just a quick sidebar, generally speaking, don't fly. And then you have patents, which is really more for technical things, inventions, pro methods, processes. They're really more advanced and generally speaking, in, in, if, you're, if you're inquiring about patents, it's because you've invented something or you've genetically modified something in some cases, et cetera. Now, really quickly, I'll just touch on because I'm going a little long on the IP spiel here, but um, trade secrets are sort of this kind of a cousin to intellectual property in that the things that we can't otherwise protect through copyrights, trademarks, or patents, we might be able to protect through trade secret provisions. Now, trade secrets are protectable only if one, we're trying to keep them secret, and two, if we have some form of a relationship with the individual that we're maintaining this trade secret with. So I'll give you a quick example. So normally I wouldn't be able to copyright, for example, a recipe. Typically speaking, you can't copyright a recipe. So what we can do is we can have an agreement with our vendor that's creating, you know, uh, at the commissary or something like that, that's creating our recipe, our formula, like Coca-Cola is a great example, mm -hmm. right? You cannot copyright their recipe, but they obviously need to produce it in large quantities. So they can have an agreement, an agreement creates a relationship, with their vendor or their manufacturer or whoever that says, we are going to provide you with certain confidential information, including but not limited to our recipe. You agree that you're going to keep that secret recipe also secret. And if for some reason you let that recipe out, you're gonna be on the hook for mm. X, Y, Z in terms of liability. So generally speaking, we can do things like protect our client lists, protect our business processes that might otherwise not be protectable. We can protect almost everything else under trade secret provisions. And there's some really interesting uh, trade secret cases out there. Yeah, that, I'm sure. Go ahead, Tim. I was going to ask, is that um, like, cause I'm sure I'm assuring if you're starting like a tech startup and, uh, and let's say hypothetically your product is based on an algorithm, 
like how how do they usually protect their secret sauce as far as like uh, like something like that would be concerned? Yeah, so trade secrets would include what everyone's heard of NDAs, right? Non disclosure yeah. agreements. So the trade secrets are really more of a strategic way to protect our intellectual property that we can't otherwise protect with these other tools. And to your point, exactly what we would do is we would say, okay, we're going to try to develop this algorithm, this software, this app, whatever it is together. And to the extent that these items, you know, the information that we're sharing is not protectable by other means, we're going to agree to keep it secret. And generally speaking, those provisions outlast the finality or the termination of the agreements between the parties. Gotcha. I think what I'm taking away from this, though, is that <laughs> this is a lot to keep track of, right? Yeah, call and your so lawyer. Call your lawyer. <laughs> that That's really the moral of the story. And I think you yeah. what you said at the beginning is so smart. Like, this is not something that you DIY. And I know even when I was getting started, I felt like, well, it's just me and I'm too small and I only have my first client. Right. Like it's too early, or, but it's really never too too early. I'm, I'm assuming you would agree with that. Like as soon as you have some of this in place and you're ready to launch your business, it's time because you just, you want to protect yourself from the very beginning. Yeah, generally speaking, I, I'll, I'll say two quick points to this. Hopefully, I'll keep them quick. My wife says getting me to shut up is the trick. So, um, no, this is great. This is great. <laughs> We're learning two, so much. <laughs> two quick points. There was a, a entrepreneur on my podcast. So, on Self Made Strategies, I interview other entrepreneurs like Sarah. And I try to pick their brain much in the same way that we're doing here, right? Because I, I, on the flip side, want to hear more and more about what entrepreneurs and innovators are doing and thinking so that I can make myself a better contributor to that space. And one of the things that I heard uh, as a piece of advice from this individual was stop trying to look at the people that are at the horizon. Look at the people that are two car lengths ahead of you, theoretically, right? So reach out to your entrepreneurial network and say, hey, who's a good attorney that you've worked with that's helped you with your business? That's a good place to start, right? Don't go to the person that's you know, running a $100 million company if you're just starting out. Go to someone that's a little bit further along than you are and say, hey, what did you do in this scenario? I will say that there are a lot of people out there doing DIY. Um, you know, And whether that's using LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer or something like that, those things are dangerous, okay? Because mm -hmm. yeah, you get your operating agreement and yes, maybe you've got your formation, but one, it's a templated operating agreement. Obviously it has to be, right? It's generated on a website. There's not a lawyer sitting there working with you and saying, these are the things you need to be looking out for. And the other thing I'll say is I can only speak for myself. I know that there are a lot of lawyers out there with very shady practices. I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, but speaking for myself and speaking for many other colleagues that I do know that are colleagues of mine in the legal industry, most of us will have a conversation with you and say, Hey, yeah, let's have a quick phone call for 30 minutes, or let's do an initial consultation for free or whatever it is, but just be transparent with that, right? When you're reaching out to the different attorneys that you're looking for, say, Hey, will you meet with me for a half an hour on the phone or at your office or over zoom or over the umpteen other ways we can communicate with each other these days and give me just kind of the big picture of what I need to do to prepare myself. Um, a quick plug, Alex, uh, Alex Hillman over at Indy Hall and I are actually working on some resources for early stage entrepreneurs to be able to have this information in one place so that it can demystify the process. Because Quite frankly, I'm of the belief that the more educated that people are, the more educated the consumers, entrepreneurs in this case, are when they're coming in to talk to me, the more prepared they'll be as well, right? And hopefully for everybody out there. So the idea is really to try to build up, you know, as much of this knowledge base as you can. And there is a lot of knowledge out there on the internet that's also useful. Um, but of course, I think you do want to work with an attorney that speaks your language, that you like working with because these things are going to be important down the line. Yeah. So I, I uh, love so, that you're, you're doing that, but go ahead, Tim. Thank you, sir. Um, so, uh, 
so like on on that point a little bit because like mm -hmm. when I started my business it was like serious bootstrapping I was working in restaurants at the time when I got started and was like and was like trying to make the transition and then like even after I left you know what I mean like like uh, most of the resources that were coming in were for my basic needs and like some upgrades to my business like what it, what it, like what what do you think is like uh, if somebody's like kind of like really tight when they're getting started like where should they put their resources um, as far as like their legal needs are concerned so first of all great question but first of all this is part of that discussion with your attorney right that should be your discussion it should be how much do i need to budget for x how much do i need to budget for the next step you know when do we need to initiate the next step first and foremost i i personally i can't speak for others but i personally try to again help out with that timeline right to say here's your first year so that you have some runway to say i need to be putting x amount aside so that i can protect myself the not to scare people out there, but this is true. People get sued. All, this is America. You can sue anyone for anything, pretty much. So people get sued all the time. And making a mistake can cost you a lot more than, you know, budgeting. So I'm all for bootstrapping. My, my wife's an entrepreneur and ultra bootstrapper. She's very, very savvy. Um, so I would say that typically speaking in your first year, you're probably going to be in the ballpark of $10,000 in legal fees if you're doing everything right. But that's including IP stuff. That's including your formation, your operating agreement, all of those things. Um, that's including getting a bunch of agreements set so that you can work with your clients, so that you can work with potential stakeholders, right? That's different for each business. There are businesses that come to me and say, you know, I'm a single member LLC. I'm running, I'm doing cupcakes out of my house right now, but I want to take this to the next level. So what do I need to do? All right. Well, you know, you probably don't need uh, employment agreements right now. You probably don't need crazy vendor agreements. You probably don't need a lot of these things right now. Get yourself formed, get yourself a, a single member operating agreement. That shouldn't cost that, that much. Um, get yourself an EIN, get yourself a bank account. Maybe you want to have an agreement that's um, sort of a master services agreement that you're giving to each client. Does not have to be earth shatteringly complex, but you probably want to protect yourself from some liabilities like food allergies, like you know your expectations with your clients, all of those things. Um, there's the old adage that uh, oral agreements are, are worth about as much as the paper that they're written on, right? So you have to be really, mm. really cautious mm. because that's how you're going to get burned. You're going to make a mistake early on and you're going to be left very vulnerable. So, you know, for the cupcake person that's transitioning into their first, you know, big step, they're probably not going to need the 10K unless they're considering renting a commercial space. Hire an attorney to negotiate your commercial space agreements. I cannot mm. emphasize that enough. A, those agreements are usually pretty negotiable. If you're going in without an attorney, you're probably missing out on either saving yourself some money or getting yourself some benefits. B, I can tell you that I have saved my clients a lot in terms of the fact that we get provisions in there that hold the landlord accountable if the space becomes, for example, unusable because there's leaks or because the AC doesn't work on a hot day like today, or because the flooring wasn't finished. These are all true stories, by the way, sadly, um, that were protected because I threw a clause in there that said, landlord doesn't fix within five days. Guess who's paying the rent? Not my client. Mm. The landlord's going to abate that rent because the client deserves to have the use of the property. Now, if the landlord's reasonably making it, I'm a reasonable person. If the landlord's reasonably making efforts to make those repairs and, you know, there's a chip shortage overseas and they literally can't fix it, but they put some um, space units in there to cool the space. They did what they were supposed to do. Let's be reasonable. But if the landlord's being unreasonable, and a lot of them are, um, I want to make sure that my client's protected. Now, if the client goes in and just says, love the space, how much is it per square foot and signs the lease? Guess what? That's going to be a problem. And trust me that I'm not kidding that I've had clients that signed the lease, 
landlord was treating them like they were, you know, the queen of whatever. Day one, client walks in and half of the flooring is missing, was not finished to spec. And the landlord blamed the client, by the way. Oh. Um, not, a, not a pretty scenario. But luckily, because we negotiated certain provisions and because we made sure that we had ways to keep the landlord accountable, at least that client was able to avoid having to waste money on rent when the space wasn't ready. So those are the types of things that your lawyer needs to be an asset and a resource to help you be better, not be one of your line items that you say, "Ugh, I got to call this guy. I'm going to spend, you know, however much per tenth per hour um, and, and I'm going to hate it. That should not yeah. be the, the experience. Yeah, it's a really good point. I also think, you know, you are like I am one person. I have been through my own life experiences. Yeah. But the reason to go with your lawyer is because how many clients have you worked with? How much experience have you had? You've learned from every single one of those. That's part of what I'm paying for. I'm paying for your knowledge and experience in this space so that I don't make a mistake that your other clients have made. Yeah. So I think that's important too. Like yeah. you are paying for expertise in this case. And, you know, and, and, it, and when it happens, it, it really does, does matter. Um, I also think you think when you're when you're small, it's just you. You think, well, that won't happen to me. I'm just little Sarah here doing my thing. But it can, and I think that that's really important. Like you think it can't happen to you, but, and I'm sure you've had uh, cases where people have had that happen. Like I never could have imagined. Who could have imagined a pandemic? You know, there, things happen in life that we can never imagine. We have to be prepared. Yeah, especially in the IP space. Real, real quick. The one of the things that happens a lot is people wait too long to look into trademarking, right? And again, if you're not working with the right attorney that's saying, hey, look, if you're opening opening Sarah's laundromat, I'm not gonna tell you you need, I know you're not going to get that trademark, yeah. right? <laughs> so I'll tell you from day one. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because maybe you don't need to, right? right? Sarah's cupcakes is fine. You don't, you're gonna sell cupcakes, you're Sarah, you're good with that. You just wanna do you know, a side hustle or a smaller business, fine. But if you're trying to go national and you're trying to grow a big brand, it's probably important to have that discussion early on. And I have had many clients along the way who waited too long and spoiler alert, five years down the line, they either got to rebrand or now they have to go in a different direction or they have to rethink their marketing strategy because they didn't take the steps early on to at least consider it. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like an it is an investment, yeah. but it's a really an investment in your future that could save you, I mean, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road. And again, I think, you know, just being 100% transparent with everyone out there who's worried about talking to an attorney. First of all, if you're worried about talking to whoever the attorney is, find a different attorney. That's not a good relationship, right? That's not a good situation. Um, and I'm not the best fit for everyone either, right? I, I'm I'm really great with very specific clients as well. And we're all like that. But find somebody that you like and that you mesh well with and that speaks your language, that makes you feel comfortable. And then the other thing is you really just, you, you should be having that discussion early on. I tell clients exactly, I draw the line. I say, you need this in my opinion, you should have this and you don't need that. And if your attorney isn't saying those things to you, then there's a problem there. That That's not a good line of communication in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just am curious about your take on the internet, right? And social media. So mm -hmm. you know, if, 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 you, if Tim creates something and then mm -hmm. I share it, you know, what do I do? Do I, do I credit? I mean, I do credit him, but, but how does it work? Cause it feels a little bit like the wild west with resharing things on social media. And, and to a degree it is, um, it is very complex. These things do not happen in black and white at all. It's very, very gray. There are a lot of gradations, but, uh, generally speaking, we have to be reasonable for you to be able to, um, effectively sue someone, right? for infringement, you'd have to have experienced some damages. And mm -hmm. so if you're just sharing his post and, and you're giving him credit, what are the damages really? Not, That's a not really, really good effective. point. 
right? Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, what people sometimes forget is that you have to have actual damages, by the way, not the, oh, Tim hurt my feelings. So, you know, because he shared my post without my permission. Doesn't work that way. So you need to have damages to begin with. But then also there's a sense of, is it worth it to really expend the resources? I, I'm not a big fan of litigation by a long stretch, <laughs> despite being an attorney. I think generally speaking, 90%, this is just my opinion, 90% of the litigation out there is a waste of resources that could be solved a lot faster with some common sense reasoning, but that's just me. Um, mm. But so a little bit of that does help. And a lot of times, to be honest, in part because I'm not a fan of litigation, but a lot of times with most clients, I will say, A, my job is to try to keep you out of litigation, one. And two, if if things start to get to that level, unless we're really in a strong position, I'm going to be very open and honest with my client and try to talk them off the ledge and say, save yourself some money, save yourself some resources, live to fight another day, not worth it. Some people, you know, spite Trump's all, but uh, generally speaking, I'm probably going to try to talk people back off the bench. Mm. Yeah. Common sense. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I, I just have a follow up just because I'm, I'm interested in um, like, are there any like radical changes like uh, on the horizon for your industry specifically? <laughs> with like, I mean, I imagine like the, like how IPs are now with, with social media and online stuff is very complicated today. And a lot of people have more access to a lot of things that they didn't used to have. And there's a lot of, of businesses opening in different spaces than there used to not be. Like, is there anything on the horizon that you see like you and your work and your industry changing a lot in the next, next, next like five, 10 years? Yeah, there is a big one. Um, and that is in the NFT, the non-fungible token space. So what I see is, I know a lot of people are super excited about all these big ticket NFTs being sold. And, you know, cryptocurrency was really, really hot when it was kind of climbing. And now that it's cooled off a little bit, you're seeing a little bit less of that on the internet. But what I actually see is in the next five to 10 years or so, you're going to see the application of non-fungible tokens in their use for um, as kind of a, a certificate of authenticity or a means to track ownership. Mm. And what that will be useful in as an example is real estate. The real estate system could not be more screwed up. The recorder of deeds in Take Your Pick County is not doing a great job, most likely. Um, they are archaic systems, they're not well kept. There's a lot of corruption and fraud going on under the radar. Um, I have a, a client who that happened to, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so you have deeds being fraudulently transferred because, you know, just there's not enough care to make sure that these systems are secure. Um, and kind of late in the game, 2021, to start trying to <laughs> retroactively make them secure. So what I think you're going to see is non-fungible tokens and blockchain being applied in smart contracts. They're already being used in smart contracts for sure. But more day-to-day, -day, everyday life in the next five to 10 years where you'll see smart contracts coming into play. And then non-fungible tokens as a means to replace, please, uh, recorders of deeds and, and the screwed up system that we have um, with government, unfortunately. So I'll give you a, a quick example for anybody listening who I just completely you know confused. Um, so a non-fungible token is basically a unique uh, blockchain digital crypto item, right? So I have a house, there's a deed that says I own that house, right? And if you went to the recorder of deeds, allegedly, you could track the ownership <laughs> all the way back, right? And assuming no one's committed any fraud or anything like that, it would be a very linear, what we call chain of title, right? Chain of ownership. And that's great as long as there's nothing that screws it up. Um, so what non-fungible tokens do though, is if I create something, if there, if I have a unique item, okay, whether that's a work of art in the real world, like the Mona Lisa or a digital piece of art that was created by Tim, um, I can attach what's called this piece of code essentially, but what's called a non-fungible token. And that means that that one token attaches to that one item and basically creates on the blockchain a ledger of any transactions associated with that item. So the second 
that Tim creates something and assigns an NFT to it, boom, that NFT is assigned, kind of like the trademarks again, in this paired relationship, NFT and unique item. Stop thinking of it in terms of works of art and all that stuff, right? Or, or digital. So a house, real estate, is inherently unique. In the eyes of the law, every parcel of real estate is inherently unique. And so without getting into, just trust me on that. Let's not get into the legal <laughs> history. We'll be here all day. Um, so my house is unique in and of itself, right? So now let's get rid of the deed system and just assign an NFT to it. And that NFT now, when I sell that home, would then track Tony owned X home from this date to that date. He had this coin, this digital coin in his digital wallet that was assigned to that house, that unique thing. And then when he transferred it, Sarah became the new owner of the home and she's on the ledger as now having the NFT. And it's, it's through cryptography and through, you know, the crypto blockchain, generally speaking, it's unhackable, generally speaking. So um, at least it's far more advanced than, you know, the reams of paper we have in City Hall that are clearly not being kept in eye on. <laughs> so, so what I see is that type of usage where you're going to see um, blockchain technology and some of the really cool things that are being developed being applicable in real world scenarios. Mm. That's awesome. I, yeah. I'd imagine though, on the same token, then that's cause for corruption as well, potentially. So it's creating a whole nother uh, legal field. Well, less so. So here's, and again, I'm not an expert in this space, by the way, I'm just a um, an enthusiast that's, that's mm. enjoying watching all this stuff happen. But um, an expert would be able to tell you, we did do a, a, an episode of self-made strategies. If you dig back a few episodes sometime around Sarah's, so go back and listen to Sarah's and then catch up and you'll get the, uh, NFT episode. We talked about it. The blockchain is much like the internet. Okay. And so what it, what that, what I mean by that is it doesn't exist anywhere. It exists because of all of the, um, uh, computers essentially that are, uh, linked to it. So they all verify the blockchain, right? And therefore make it much more difficult to crack or to hack because basically you have tens of thousands, if not more, probably way more computers, essentially, right? I'm really dulling it down as much as I can, verifying the transactions. And so if a handful of them got hacked and said, no, Sarah didn't buy it, Tim, you know, nefariously, sorry, Tim. Tim nefariously somehow got access to this NFT and he's the owner, mm -hmm. the 9,000 some other ones would say, no, wait a minute, those blockchain ledgers are incorrect. Oh. They don't match the 9,000 that we have over here. And therefore that gets nullified. So oh, that's, wow. that's what makes it. And again, I'm dumbing it down way, way, way down. And, Thank and mostly, you. mostly because I'm dumb. Uh, but that's basically in, in very, rudimentary terms that's basically how it works and that's why it's so much better because right do, now go ahead Tim. sorry i was just gonna ask do do um do courts and uh already legally recognize smart contracts or does like legislature need to like do we need legislation to recognize them yeah so um unfortunately things are, are speeding up a little bit but the pandemic really shined a light on how far behind we are on yeah. a lot of these things right um in part because we we have the infrastructure, we just weren't flexible with it. And the court system and the legal industry, maybe purposely, maybe not, I don't know, conspiracy theory, um, is a little archaic. And I, I think that it's intentionally dragging its feet on what's eventually going to be inevitable. Now, the legality of it, there was already one property sold, I think, don't quote me, but I think it was on the West Coast, with an NFT attached to it. Not exactly the way that I explained it in terms of the use that I see. This is just my hypothesis, but, um, but there has already been some of those examples. And so anything that you can attach uniqueness to, you could essentially tie to an NFT. Would it overpower the recorder of deeds office to the extent that I'm envisioning in my utopian society? Probably not because they're going <laughs> to hang on for dear life, right? But 
Um, but there's hope at least that that we could say. I'll give. I'll tell you right now without divulging client information what's going on. So in Philadelphia, um, and this is true. So uh, there are nefarious individuals out there fraudulently transferring deeds electronically using the mm. city's e-reporting system. Now, here's the saddest part of that story: is that the recorder of deeds office, I speak as a whole, and it's essentially true, knows that this is going on. This is in the news. If you go Google it, you know, it's there. It's in the news. And as a matter of fact, I pre-pandemic went in person and they essentially said to me, oh, so-and-so? Oh yeah, they fraudulently transferred like nine other properties, not just your clients. So they know it's going on and still no one's doing anything about it. And the worst part is that the clients, the individuals that are the innocent victims have to go hire an attorney expend additional resources to get back what's rightfully theirs. And what the city and the recorder of deeds office clearly knows is fraudulently happening. Mm. So there isn't even a quick way to undo it. That's how archaic our system is, right? That the nefarious individual is basically doing one of these outside of city hall and my client and others are the ones saying, well, I'm stuck. I have no choice but to pay an attorney go through the legal system, which is dragging its feet beyond all belief, especially because of the pandemic. Now we couldn't have predicted that, but in the best case pre-pandemic, it would have taken six, nine months in the yeah. best case. And, um, and so you have these situations where it's clear, we know common sense. The three of us here are saying, this is ridiculous. How come no one's solving it? And nobody is because- yeah. And, and the vibe down there, by the way, is not my problem. You have to go yeah. file your your go file uh, your complaint in court and yeah. go through the procedure. And we're sitting here saying, myself and my clients saying, you know this is happening. Yeah, we know. And there's no quick way to undo. You know, you're telling me, you know that the document I'm holding in front of you is fraudulent. And you're telling me that I have to tell my clients we have to go to court. Whew. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh that, uh, this, this, like it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's especially frustrating because like as somebody who like wants like us to have like effective, I'm sorry, I'm going off topic, but no, no, as far no. as somebody who like, like, like believes like that, like, you know, I don't know, like I think it's important to have effective governments, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. This undermines trust. In, in in what the government can do for society and and uh, and uh, and it kind of proves all the people that that you know what I mean ha like have stuff to say about go like governments and try to undermine it all the time you know what I mean it proves them right in some ways you know what I mean and it's, it's sadly it, it hurts it's, it's you know? very sad it's very yeah. sad that it's 2021 and this is the way that things are yeah right yeah. but you see it everywhere it's not just in this one example you see it yeah. everywhere and and that's the thing that we hope that these disruptive technologies can eventually overcome. But as you see with cryptocurrency, it's the same thing. Governments are going to hang on for dear life <laughs> because that would completely rock the system. And not because it would rock the system and make it collapse necessarily, but because, you know, then the recorder of deeds wouldn't be. By the way, that's an elected position. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, have we, you we, ever we, voted yeah. for a recorder of deeds? No. I haven't. So... Yeah. Oh boy. Well, yeah. I think what we've learned today <laughs> is that we need a good lawyer and we need somebody in our corner who's going to fight for us and help us and guide us through this process. So Tony, please share with everybody how they can work with you, how they can get in touch with you. Um, and I'd love to know how we can, you know, stay on top of some of these new features and, and uh, programs you're releasing. So what's the best way to get in touch with you? Awesome. So I'll make it really easy on Instagram mainly at college cast pods all one word um we're doing really really cool things we've got our pilot students uh our first years launching their podcasts um super super cool program we're hoping to empower student voices and we're really trying to do good uh overall and to help people kind of take control of their own outcomes hopefully building some budding entrepreneurs and content creators um at self-made strategies also one word and that's self-made strategies on wherever you listen to podcasts as well. Um, please subscribe, like, leave a review, et cetera. And at Lopes Law LLC 
on at Instagram as well. We don't post a lot there, lopeslawllc.com if you need to reach out or info at lopeslawllc.com. And I'm sure you'll leave everything in the show notes. Um, I do want to say one quick thing. If you're listening to this show and you love what Sarah and Tim do, they do an awesome job. This was a great experience, by the way. I loved being awesome. on the on the show. Um, go subscribe. Give them a like. Those are the huge, huge things you can do to really help their show to grow and to get to other individuals. Uh, so please do that for them if you enjoyed listening to this program. Perfect. I love awesome. that. And we always wrap up the show with what are you into right now? So uh, Tim, Tony, anything that you guys are into right now? And this can be related to the show or not. Tim, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry. Hold on. Can you start? I have sure. it. I just need to pull it so up. So yeah. one, one thing I'm into right now is the Euro Cup. Uh, the Euro Cup is on right now, I think, through July 11th. I always think it's really cool. I am I am a Portuguese-American, Luso-American. Uh, it was first, first generation. So I have I have uh, Portugal that I'm rooting for, of course. But, uh, but I also think it's really cool because it's a worldwide event in many ways, and you get to see a lot of different cultures that we're not typically exposed to. So I love that. Check it out on ESPN. I've got no skin in the game at, um, with ESPN, but um, I'll, I'll always take a sponsorship if they're listening. Um, awesome. So, <laughs> so that's what I'm into right now. All right, Tim. And uh, I'm uh, actually, this was a recommendation from Jeff, who's unfortunately not here today. Uh, it's by author Brene Brown. Uh, it's called The Power of Vulnerability, Teaching Authenticity, Connection, and Courage. Um, what I really like about it, it's kind of like the anti self help book. Um, it's kind of like, like it, for me, like one of the big things was it's kind of like very much about like it's okay to be a normal person, especially in today's days of like, like you know, like online stuff and having to constantly prove how amazing you are all the time and how much that can actually improve your life to just like not just like step out of that like particular rat race. Um, really great book, a lot of great insights there, but, and it's super consumable for like everybody. And, uh, it talks a lot about the addiction of productivity. I know nobody has that here, uh, who's in this, but, uh, it would probably be a good book. Anyways, anyways. So, uh, yeah, that's it. I love that. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, Tony, for joining us today. And we will catch everybody next week. We are going to be talking about how do we build strategies next week. And Tim's going to be guiding us through that conversation. So we will see everybody then. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.